Okay, so I think we're almost uh, like at five past the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome back for our first Home Dialysis Journal Club of this calendar year. Uh, presenting today is one of our first year nephrology fellows, um, Dr. Sarah Abukar. Sarah did her medical school training at the American University of Beirut, um, and she did her residency uh, training in internal medicine in Richmond University Medical Center in Staten Island, and now she is with us here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Today, we're going to be talking about embedded PD catheters, experience and results from a North American center. Sarah, take it away. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Osama, uh, for the introduction. So today I'm going to present this article uh, by McCormick et al. that was published in 2006 in Canadian International. But also I'm going to present other articles which investigated the, the technique and uh, present the results. So uh, first of all, I'm going to go over the different types of PD catheters. I'm going to talk about um, the Moncrief Popovich method and how the other investigators modified it. I'm going to talk about the Ottawa's experience, which is the article that I'm presenting today. And then I'm going to talk about the risk of mechanical complications and infectious complications uh, in, this, uh, in this technique. And then I'm going to summarize. So there are many types of PD catheters, and research is not conclusive on which type is the best. Tenkov is the name of, uh, that is given to all PD catheters regardless. Uh, and Dr. Henry Tenkov is the, is, is the, the doctor uh, who first uh, developed those indwelling PD catheters in 1963. PD catheters are usually made of sterile silicon rubber, and they come in different sizes and shapes. Um, as you can see, um, uh, there are the, the straight ones, the ones with an external, uh, with, a, with a coiled uh, internal segment. There are ones with double cuff and uh, ones with a single cuff. There are the ones with a swan neck and ones with a bead and a flange like the Missouri catheter. And this is the Moncrief Popovich catheter, which, which is made of a coiled uh, segment uh, inter in the internal segment. And then there is uh, two uh, Dacron cuffs the uh, the outer one is elongated up to 2.5 centimeters and this gives it uh, this uh, uh, ensures the tissue ingrowth uh, uh, around this the decron pot and uh, cuff thus uh, supporting uh, giving a barrier to uh, bacterial growth also the catheters uh, uh, have holes inside in order to uh, facilitate dialysate flow So this is a picture depicting the PD catheter in place with it, uh, with the first cuff uh, embedded in the subcutaneous tissue. The other cuff is embedded in the muscle. And then you have the external segment outside the skin and then the internal segment uh, in the peritoneum. Um, uh, so recent meta-analysis meta have shown that there are no uh, significant difference between the different types of catheter, whether they are coiled or straight. And there are also no significant difference in peritonitis uh, rate or exit side tunnel infection rate. Also, there are no significant difference in all cause mortality between the straight and the coiled PD catheter. And it is important because as I go over the studies, uh, different investigators uh, is, uh, use different kinds of uh, catheters interchangeably. So what about the uh, uh, Moncrief-Popovich approach? At that time, Moncrief uh, and his uh, colleagues have noticed that the peritonitis rates were very high, despite using different sterile techniques and different attachment systems. Uh, this is because uh, the existing catheter implantation techniques violate the fundamental premise of wound healing, where the uh, foreign object is present in the, uh, in the open wound and, and thus, it promotes the passage of bacteria and its colonization into the tunnel and the cuffs. And this is manifested by the almost universal presence of biologic pro products of bacteria on the external and internal surfaces of the catheters. Usually, uh, bacteria reach, uh, reach into the peritoneum through, through uh, three different mechanisms. The first one is the touch con contamination, 
when, uh, which, which occurs uh, when uh, at the time of exchange uh, from the hand into the uh, tunnel, into the inside of the tunnel. The second, uh, the second uh, way is the pericatheter transfer, which is from the skin uh, into the perilumenal uh, uh, wound. Uh, and then uh, the bacteria goes into the, uh, into, into the wound and uh, colonizes the catheter and the cough. And it's, it also happens if there is any uh, disruption in the material integrity, and that's when peritonitis occur. So for Moncrief uh, Popovich, the approach, um, he suggested that to place, to implant the catheter, but rather than uh, putting the, uh, implanting the catheter and putting the external segments out of, outside the skin, he suggested embedding it subcutaneously for to, four to for four to six weeks until, until uh, tissue uh, in growth happens. And after that, a skin incision uh, is needed in order to exteriorize the um, catheter. And then the catheter can be used uh, almost uh, at the same time with full volume exchange. So he went on in 1989 and tested his hypothesis on 59 patients. And he embedded the catheters uh, in them for a medium period of 4.5 weeks with a range between three and 24 weeks. And then um, he followed those patients over two years. When he exteriorized the catheters, none of them was obstructed and they were able to start a full volume exchange. Um, the, uh, they, they, he had around 11 patients developing peritonitis. 81 of them did not experience any peritonitis during the observation period. And the rate of uh, peritonitis was one in 20 uh, after the use of this approach compared to one in nine patient months before using this approach in this clinic. He went on in 2092, in uh, 1992, and he uh, investigated this approach in 74 patients. And he had seven episodes of perit peritonitis with a rate of one in 28 uh, patient months. And the total exit side infections uh, rate was one uh, in 12.6 patient month. And this was compared to the rate of exit side infections uh, in other uh, studies at that time. So this is the Moncrief Popovich approach. Investigators, investigators took this approach and modified it. Rather than using the Moncrief uh, Popovich catheter, they used regular Tenkov catheter, whether it is coiled or swanac. Uh, basically, they said they can, you can use any type of catheter, inexpensive catheter, as long as its diameter is as, uh, as, as big as the tank of diameter. And then um, they embedded this using a tunneler. And the tunneler has uh, an arrowhead at the end of it. The tunneler helped guide the catheter into the subcutaneous tissue. And then the arrowhead broke and plugged uh, the exit side of the catheter. And then the approach goes on just like uh, Moncrief -Pop uh, Popovich approach, where they wait for four to six weeks and, um, uh, and then they uh, exteriorize the, um, they exteriorize the uh, catheter. So here we come uh, to our study, to the study that I want to present, which is the same, uh, the same group of investigators who modified uh, the, uh, the uh, Moncrief Popovich approach. And uh, it happened in Ottawa University, which is a university uh, hospital, uh, tertiary care center, and it is a catchment area of 1.2 million inhabitants. Uh, at that time, in January 2000, um, two PD home catheter, uh, PD home units uh, were merging together, and they were trying to find standardized uh, clinical practices for, the, for this unit. So they uh, adopted the Moncrief uh, Popovich technique as one of those practices, mainly because they had restraints on surgical resources and it was very difficult for them to get the PD catheter placed in a timely fashion. So by using this embedded technique, um, they guarantee that the mature catheter is present whenever it's needed. So they followed since 2000, uh, they followed the patients who ever indicated PD, catheter, uh, PD preference, and they uh, referred those patients to two dedicated surgeons to insert this embedded catheter. And uh, they referred those patients around three to six months before they anticipated they will need hemodialysis. Most of the patients had laparoscopic insertion of PD catheter. 
and they had a double cuffed oil catheter uh, with arcuate and inserted. The mean age uh, of the uh, the mean age of the patients at catheter exteriorization was 60 years. 60% 60 of the patients were male and 50% of them were diabetics. The main cause of end stage kidney disease was diabetes. The second main cause is ischemic nephropathy, then glomerular nephritis, and then polycystic kidney disease. They had we, they had a total of uh, th uh, 304 patients uh, who got embedded catheters. 266 had exterior ex had their catheter exteriorized. 21 of them had CKD all the way during the duration of this study, and 11 of them had futile insertion where they either died or they had a, tra a transplant kidney, or um, uh, they shifted, they simply shifted to hemodialysis for some reason. So the median time uh, for uh, exteriorization was around 90 days, which is three months. 85% uh, of the catheter, catheter were working at the time of exteriorization. And the rest of them were salvaged, 40% of the rest of them was salvaged with either um, radiologic techniques or surgical techniques. The primary overall rate of primary non-function uh, was 7%. Leaks were not, in, were not frequent and abdominal wall uh, hematomas were also not frequent. Uh, peritonitis rate was around one episode in 33 patient month. And 62% of the patients had no episode of peritonitis during the period of interest. So, um, so at the end of this, they uh, reached, uh, they reached uh, the conclusion that there are a lot of advantages of using this embedded technique over using the conventional technique on top of having lower complication rates and lower infectious uh, uh, complication rate, uh, the procedure is elective. It can be done anytime. There's no requirement for flushing for the catheter before the use. Dialysis action matures when dialysis is required and there, uh, faster training happens as full well volumes can be used immediately. Also from the caregiver point of uh, perspective, uh, the patient needs not to be bridged with, uh, with hemodialysis um, um, and there have better captures of, of those patients who initially indicate preference for PD and improved overall utilization of PD with associated decreased resource utilization. The only disadvantage about this technique is that it is a two-step procedure where insertion should happen at one point and then exteriorization should happen at another point. So the same group of investigators went on after having those positive results, and they wanted to investigate about whether the uh, uh, duration of embedment affects uh, catheter survival. So they used the same cohort of patients, and they followed up over six years. The cohort was a little bit big, bigger this time. The primary uh, outcome for them was catheter loss. And catheter loss was defined as the removal of the catheter and the transfer to hemodialysis as a result of either mechanical or infectious complications. Their secondary outcomes was the time uh, to first peritonitis, uh, peritonitis rate, and the rate of primary catheter failure and the proportion requiring radiologic or surgical intervention to obtain a functional catheter. Primary catheter failure is defined as the catheter not being used at all after exteriorization uh, despite salvaging technique, uh, whether radiologic or surgical, after 90 days. So they had around um, uh, 435 PD catheters embedded. Uh, 350 of them were exteriorized. 380 never exteriorized for some reason. Um, the medium time for embedment was uh, 83 days. And, uh, and they divided the patients into tertiles where um, uh, the, uh, uh, the first group of patients are the patients who had uh, their catheter exteriorized between 11 and 47 days after, after implantation. The second group of patients had it exteriorized between 48 days and 133 days. And the third group of patients had it exteriorized between th after uh, 130 days of uh, implantation. As I mentioned in the previous study, they had 85% of good immediate function. This is the baseline characteristics of the patients, which were uh, similar in all the three groups, except for the fact that uh, group three patients had a higher GFR uh, at exteriorization, at implantation, compared to group two and group one.
So 20% um, of the patients had uh, experienced catheter loss. And the time to, to catheter loss was uh, associated with the time embedded prior to use. The time to catheter loss was shortest in group one and longest in group two. Also, 7% of the catheter were complicated with primary mechanical function, but this rate was uh, significantly different between the three groups, where group two had the lowest rate of this complication compared to group three. And also group three exhibited more need for intervention uh, for mechanical complications compared to group two and group one. So as for the peritonitis rate, um, uh, it was one in 33 patient month. 33 of the patients experienced peritonitis and uh, the, the time to first peritonitis was significantly longer in group three compared to group two and one. However, uh, the peritonitis rate was equal in all three groups. Now I'm gonna go over uh, another article that uh, investigated this technique However, um, they wanted to compare um, this technique to the conventional techniques. So they had a cohort of patients of 460, uh, of 460 patients, and the median age uh, was 47 years, with 46% uh, of them were females and 22% of them were diabetics. They were divided into two groups, those who received the conventional mini laparotomy uh, technique and the ones who were who received the um, uh, the Moncrief Popovich uh, technique uh, during the mini laparotomy, um, all the patients' characteristics were equal, were evenly distributed, except for the fact that lesser diabetics were present in the uh, new technique. So the overall catheter failure was around thirty percent. However, they've noticed that the patients who received the new technique had a lower rate of leak, they had a lower rate of obstruction, and the break-in time really did not matter uh, regarding uh, the, the rate of obstruction. Also, the patients who received the new technique had a lower rate of uh, uh, exit side infections and a longer exit side infection-free survival. Peritonitis rate and peritonitis free survival rate did not differ significantly uh, uh, in, in, both, in both groups. So Moncrief Popovich technique was significantly associated with a longer early uh, exit site infection free survival. Uh, catheter survival by technique was significantly superior in comparison with the other methods with the, with the, with the conventional techniques. However, when they um, adjusted for the buried time, uh, this difference did not reach uh, uh, significance, statistical significance. It should be noted that diabetic status did not affect the survival rate in both groups, uh, but however, more females had uh, catheter loss compared to males. Another group also had uh, investigated uh, the, uh, whether the duration of uh, embedment affected uh, catheter survivor, and they had a cohort of patients of 122, and um, they had them all uh, uh, had the catheter embedded in them. And then at the exteriorization, almost 85% had a good flow. Uh, and then this rate increased to around 90, 92% after um, uh, surgical or radiological intervention. And when they adjusted for sex, race, and age and diabetes, they found out that the embedment duration did not really affect the catheter survival. Furthermore, there were no correlation between the embedment duration and the membrane transport status as determined by the standard peritoneal equilibration test. And then other investigators uh, wanted to, uh, to uh, test what are the uh, risk factors that lead to catheter loss in this specific technique, and what are the risk factors in the patients that lead to prolonged embedment time. So they had 80 uh, uh, 80 patients, 84 patients. Uh, many of them were um, diabetics and obese, and they uh, had them. Uh, they had the uh, a, a new technique uh, done for them. Some of them received a regular tank of the catheter, and others received a, a two-piece a two-piece catheter, which is a long catheter. 
and uh, in this in this study they've noticed that the length of the of the catheter was the only significant risk factor for catheter survival however it should be noted that many of the patients who had a longer catheter were uh, obese and uh, diabetic so those can be a confounding variable um, also they've no they've noticed that um, the uh, the history of uh, previous surgery or um, having concomitant surgery during um, uh, implantation did not affect catheter survival. On the other hand, um, they've noticed that the level of GFR at, at implantation and the albumin level, level affected the uh, duration of embedment significantly, where higher levels led to prolonged uh, embedment time. They postulated that, that the cause of embedded catheter malfunction in those patients who had a longer catheter could be a fluid column uh, uh, pressure, it could be postural changes or variation in intraperitoneal pressure. Also, since more, many of those patients are obese and diabetics, increased inflammatory state in those patients might also contribute, have contributed to the catheter loss. The last retrospective study that I want to present uh, what is a negative study that was done in London uh, in a large tertiary referral center with a catchment area of around 1 million inhabitants, and they followed the patients over five years. Uh, they, uh, in this study, they used a, a, a long 63 centimeter straight neck double cuff coiled tank of catheter, and most of the um, implantation happened laparoscopically. In this study, the, the overall utilization uh, rate was 72%, which is much lower compared to the other studies of 85 to 99%. And the futile placement rate was around 12%. The median survival rate was uh, uh, 39 weeks. 60% of the catheter were lost, either due to mechanical complications or infectious complications. And they concluded that diabetes and the prolonged embedment duration are both, are both uh, significantly associated with primary catheter loss. And also they've concluded that those patients who had a primary non-functioning catheter are more likely to have uh, surgical interventions compared to those who had a catheter working at uh, exteriorization. The adjusted risk of catheter loss at any given time point was 74% less for catheters that functioned uh, primarily following exteriorization compared to those who had a, a catheter not, function, not, uh, not functioning uh, at the exteriorization. So this, is, this table depicts all the uh, retrospective studies that I've mentioned before. It, it, it is worth noting that the positive studies had a lower median embedment time compared to the studies who, were, who, had, who, uh, con uh, who published a negative uh, results about the technique. The last two studies I, I want to mention are, are those studies that tackled uh, peritonitis rate in those patients and uh, in this technique, and uh, they are prospective studies. Uh, the first one uh, had 60 patients divided into two groups. Uh, 30 patients received the conventional technique and other 30 patients received the Moncrief Popovich technique. Uh, and then they subdivided those patients into the uh, type of attachment sets uh, where the, uh, the standard spike uh, attachment set was used and the Y-connect set. And they've concluded that peritonitis rate and exercise infection rate were similar in both groups of patients. However, when they uh, adjusted to uh, the attachment, uh, the attachment uh, type, they found out that the patients who, were, who, who received the new technique, who had the new technique, plus they had the Y-Connect system, had the lower incidence of peritonitis and exercise infection. And also the total peritonitis free period in those patients, in those subgroup of patients were lower in this group, uh, were, were lower compared to other subtypes. Also, those subgroup of patients uh, had significantly lower rates of complications related to staph aureus and pseudomonas infection compared to other subgroups. The last uh, prospective study um, was done in Sweden uh, that uh, comprised 120 patients 
and they divided the patients into those who received the conventional uh, technique and the conventional uh, tenth of catheter. Those two groups received the uh, Mon uh, Moncrief Popovich technique uh, uh, catheter, but uh, ha but uh, this group had the catheter buried in them, and the other group had the catheter non buried in them. And the baseline characteristics of the patients are similar in all groups. Uh, they've reached that there are no statistical significance uh, between all groups regarding peritonitis rates and exit site infection rates. Also, the cumul cumulative probability of not develop uh, developing uh, exit site infections and uh, peritonitis are similar in both groups at 6, 12, and 24 months. It's worth, it is worth noting that the group that had the Moncrief Popovich uh, catheter embedded in them but not buried, no, they, uh, sorry, had the, had the catheter but did not, did not have it embedded in them, had uh, no episodes of exit site infection. Um, lastly, there are no, no clear guidelines on what type of catheter and what type of technique should be used uh, for the patients. Um, usually it is a personalized uh, 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 decision and the method it needs to be determined based on the patient's characteristics. The International Society of PD recommends using the double cost catheters in order to reduce the peritonitis rates. In summary, retrospective studies showed um, prolonged uh, embedment time that might be associated with higher mechanical complications. The prospective study failed to prove that uh, patients who received this technique had a better peritonitis or exit site infection rates, but the, the studies were very small and underpowered. There are so many advantages of using this catheter. First of all, it, uh, it gives time uh, using this technique. It gives time for the catheter to heal. Uh, there is greater patient acceptance for it. And uh, it, reduced, uh, it reduced the peritoneal dialysis unit nursing uh, workload. A full dose peritoneal dialysis can be started immediately. And it is an excellent strategy to avoid crash hemodialysis with a, a central venous catheter. Also, it allows more efficient surgical scheduling of catheter placement as a non-urgent elective procedure, thereby reducing stress on operating uh, room access. So the usefulness of the catheter embedding procedure as a strategy to increase PD penetration and lower centers, central venous catheter usage should be explored by comparing a patient group undergoing early catheter placement with embedment with a group waiting for conventional timing of catheter insertion close to anticipated need. Those are my references. Thank you. Great job, Sarah. Very comprehensive and covered uh, covered the topic pretty extensively. Now, before we uh, start, is there anybody here on the call who is in a center that utilizes embedded PD catheters? Okay. So I'm going to take that. I couldn't, hear, I couldn't hear the answer. Is anybody doing it? It was when I was there. Oh, is that you, uh, Mary? Yeah, they would do it on a case by case basis. It wasn't standard practice um, when I was there. Uh, but we did have patients that we would do that. So that like we had a guy who was a camp counselor and he wanted to work for the summer and start when he got back, places like that. But it wasn't standard. Gotcha. How long ago was that? 2015, 2016. Okay. So it's. Yeah, it's I was going to say, I, 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 I'm sure. Tom remembers and probably Joanne, I don't know if he came to their institutions, but Jack Moncrief came here to Rush years ago when he first wanted to, was starting to popularize this whole uh, process and gave a presentation. And I mean, for us, the, the rate limiting factor is the surgeon. And when the surgeon saw this, they basically said, there's no way they're gonna do it because it just becomes too, too complicated in the sense of the whole process. And, it, and so for us, even attempting it was kind of it was abandoned before it even started because they just felt that this would be too involved, if you will. And so we never really did it. And in all honesty, I mean, it's a great presentation. We were never convinced that it was that much better than what we were already doing. So we just kind of stuck with what we have, if you will. But the presentation, I didn't get any suggestion that we should start doing it. 
that is the main thing. At least from my perspective, I didn't hear anything in the exhaustive detailed presentation that would suggest that we should even attempt at doing it. So uh, that, uh, uh, that's because when you ask for an urgent start PD and a cat placement, you can get it done, which is the case at Vanderbilt as well. Uh, and so that that's a good counter argument is that you don't have any trouble with uh, getting the surgeons to do it. But in the original paper that uh, Sarah presented uh, by Brendan McCormick, uh, that was one of their arguments is that they they had trouble getting the surgeons to do it. And so that so when it can be done electively months in advance, that's advantageous. The person I know that's that's still doing this is Isaac Teitelbaum, and mm -hmm. and Isaac exter exterior you know the word uh, himself <laughs> in the clinic. When I tried to bring this to Vanderbilt, probably in maybe the mid two thousand five in that range, uh, uh, the David Schaefer, our head surgeon on the transplant side, just was not interested, and I, I it wasn't worth convincing him. And then the second issue that came up was the legality of myself and our home dialysis program actually doing this minor surgery. We ran into some barriers uh, that uh, that weren't going to allow us to do that. And that to me, it wasn't worth fighting if the surgeon wasn't interested and I was running into institutional barriers. Uh, so I abandoned it. But, but theoretically, I, I like the idea of of doing it, uh, but the the main argument I think the one that uh, Dr. Yerbari brings up is the uh, uh, the the uh, ease of the surgeon putting in a catheter in a fairly prompt manner when you need it. And if you've got that, then then it doesn't really make sense that you have to do this. And by the way, uh, it didn't really come up a lot, but but this whole idea kind of refutes the idea of flushing. That's one thing. Uh, and the other point I want to make is, in several of the studies that Sarah reported, both the primary study and then some other ones, that uh, about I'm going to roughly 35 percent of the patients had all of the peritonitis. And I want to highlight that when Salim Majayas did an analysis of uh, over 2,000 episodes of peritonitis in the United States, he came up with a similar figure. Basically, I think if I remember, it was 38% of all the peritonitis episodes, uh, uh, pardon me, 100% of all the peritonitis episodes occurred in 38% of the patients. And looking at it, the flip side of that is over 60% of patients don't get peritonitis in their uh, lifetime on PD. I'll just say that like Ottawa, we also have problems with getting sufficient operating room time to just put in PD catheters when we want. So we also embraced uh, the embedded catheters, but we had about a 25% primary non-function rate. Mm. And I just want to point out the emotional cost to everybody of the primary non-function. You know, the patient's getting sick, you book the week of training, the patient comes in, gets it exteriorized, and it doesn't work. And all of a sudden you're scrambling to try to do something. So in the end, we just gave up on it because the surgeon did, didn't seem to have a learning curve. It, we were just having very mediocre results. So we just sort of abandoned it. Joanne, have you seen a similar problem with, I mean, do you have IR put in your catheters or do you have the surgeons do it? Yes, just in the last uh, about three years or so, we've had IR put in some of the catheters. We still like to do it best with the surgeon because it's under, you know, laparoscopy, advanced techniques and all that. So, but if it's an uncomplicated patient, we'll get IR to put it in. But we only get one OR date uh, a month and we can use four or five patients in that one OR day. And then that's it for until the next month. Yeah, I, I, you just the bringing up the issue of you know the emotional trauma on non-functioning catheters. We've our IRP, we have really nice, and very good IR people. They're very competent, but we found that you know on one patient just recently they put in three catheters that didn't work, and I finally I had our surgeon do it. And it worked you know worked perfectly. Um, it may be that, and it's interesting. It doesn't matter the size of the patient because the patient this particular patient was actually a fairly thin person. And it just turned out when the surgeons get in there under direct visualization, they found yeah. out that the omentum was all matted and they were able to kind of maneuver around that. So 
you know, yeah. I've kind of tried to, I've continued to try and use the surgeons just because I've always had better success. And, you know, they're usually pretty good about getting them in fairly fast around here because they can get OR time relatively frequently. But the IR, we've, we've had a number of problems. And, and uh, as you say, it's not only emotionally traumatic for the patient, it's emotionally traumatic for us. You know, Everybody, <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I think that's, that's an interesting point, and I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. So how do we compare uh, the need for intervention on uh, inserted PD catheters mentally to the need for revisions on, let's say, AV axes? Um, personally, I'll say, like, I, I tend to have a bias that if a PD catheter is not working, I become a lot more upset at the fact that it's not working and frustrated and trying to figure out ways to salvage it. But have we become a little bit more complacent then when it comes to AV accesses that do require one, two, sometimes three revisions? And we just accept that that's part of, you know, the process and this is what you need to go through? Well, I mean, sometimes that's kind of a marker of the person's vascular problems, right? I mean, they're you know, the whole issue, I forget it was Jay Wisher who had an article out there some years ago, maybe been even Burkhardt's group, but they basically showed, you know, putting in accesses ahead of time, uh, one of the determinants of them doing poorly is the number of interventions they required before they were mature enough to be used. Um, and so I, I you know, I, I don't know if we're complacent. I just think that we're kind of stuck with the hand we're dealt, if you will. Uh, everybody's kind of happy to blame it on the surgeons, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, our patient population is becoming such that they're the high risks of having poorly functioning accesses from the get-go, right? Diabetic, overweight, um, um, uh, older age, you know, I mean, the, 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 this, this, the deck is stacked against them from the get-go. I mean, the thing, at least with hemodialysis, we can put a catheter in them and at least dialyze and we're trying to figure things out. With perineal dialysis, where we're trying to avoid putting a damn catheter in them, we're stuck, you know, and, and, uh, you know, God forbid they need to get on dialysis quickly. You know, you try and do these early starts and you 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 get faced with a catheter that uh, isn't functioning. So now you're really stuck. You know, just a point, I mean, because there are fellows around the issue of the, uh, you are getting so far the idea that the interventionists are worse than the surgeons for placing PD catheter in terms of primary or secondary functioning. And I think that that is very local because we have as good an experience with interventionists as we have nef interventionist nephrologists who do that all the time. So that may be a different point. It's not a nephrologist for our group, but the interventionist who does most of the procedure happened to be a nephrologist who became an interventionist. And now he's just, he's just doing that. But our experience in terms of placement of PD catheter and functioning is as good or perhaps even better with the interventionist. So I think that that is a local experience. No, that may well be. That may be, well be. I mean, if you've got a group that's actually you're satisfied with and they're, they're doing a good job and the catheters function right from the get-go, by all means, um, that's so one way to get them in fairly quickly because IR can usually schedule the patients within a 24, 48-hour period of time, which is definitely an advantage. So let, let me ask a question related to that, uh, to what uh, Dr. Uh, Irabari and, and uh, uh, Corbett are saying, and, and ask the question to, as we investigate this, or if you were to uh, perform an investigation, how do you account for the uh, variety of surgeons doing the procedure? Because you, you, in, uh, Jaime used the word experience three or four times in his last comment, and so he was referring to institutional experience, but I'm referring to proceduralist experience. And I will point out that the paper that Sarah presented, uh, Andrew Davenport's paper out of uh, London, uh, uh, Andrew was very frustrated. I know because Andrew and I are, are pretty close. He was very frustrated because he he couldn't account for the, the registrars or, or the number of uh, people doing the operation, and he was disappointed because the senior surgeon often wasn't in the operating room uh, mm -hmm. for the initial placement. So, how do how how is how would one address this uh, if one were to study the different uh, uh, the the variety of different proceduralists? 
No, that's I mean, that's a good point. I don't know. I mean, the person I work with, I've worked with for 40 years now, and, and uh, we've got a good report, and he's very competent, at least our surgeon. But you're right. There's going to be a variety, you know, a mix depending upon how long the surgeon's been doing it, you know, how many surgeon, different surgeons are doing it. I mean, that kind of case mix issue becomes, I think, sometimes very difficult to adjust for, for at least it's when, you're use, when you're trying to compare with multiple institutions. Uh, in no other area in the surgical approach, I'm not a surgeon, obviously, where I find more clear-cut difference determined by the person who's doing the procedure is in AV access and in placement of PD catheter. I mean, in my years of experience, I've experienced so many surgeons, and clearly, surgeon A, B, or C, they're so different. And it's not that one is more handsome than the other, or it's more whatever. I mean, it is just a matter... <laughs> Whoever is doing it makes a tremendous difference. When you are placing an AV fistula or when you are placing a PD catheter, it really makes a difference with the surgeon. It's not just a matter of having the PD catheter placed. It is who is placing it. What can I say? No, 100%. It's, it's funny that you say that, you know, we talk about this because I literally just had a meeting that I had to hop off of. Uh, to, jo to join this one uh, where we were talking about some issues that we're having with AV access. He's here and, uh, you know, it was, it was the surgeons and IR and the nephrologist that were on the call. And the surgeons were saying, you know, sometimes if a patient needs an intervention on their access and they get sent to IR, sometimes just by seeing the name of the IR attending, let's say who's going to be intervening, they can predict whether the patient's going to end up with, you know, a tunneled catheter, right? <laughs> Rather than the salvaging, you know, successful salvaging of the AV axis. And I think it's hard because it's symmetric where you can't really put a magic number, right? If you did 20 procedures, right? Is there, is there everybody who's done X number of procedures as good or as proficient as everybody else? You know, the, the answer, of course, is, is probably no. But, you know, just to go back to these embedded catheters, is there a situation in which we think that they would be indicated and in standard of care other than um, situations where you don't have ready access to a surgeon or a proceduralist who would be able to place the catheter for you promptly if your patient requires either an urgent start or uh, regular, you know, uh, start PD? Is it just, um, is it something that you, you would only resort to if you don't have that access? Well, just to echo what Steve said, uh, which echoed what I said is, uh, I still like, if you have the luxury of it, to have a laparoscopic good look see, all things being equal. Um, I can tell you what we do, and it doesn't mean that it's the right thing. <laughs> but I mean, if a patient has a virgin abdomen and there are no other issues, major issues, we directly send it to the interventionist. If the patient has any potential surgical issues, we send it to the surgeon. Is that right? I don't know. But that's what we have been doing. Yeah. And I can't remember who it was, if it was uh, Dr. Golper or Dr. Bartman. Someone had mentioned to me about um, the infections uh, when it comes to exteriorizing the catheter and how that may be related to that, sur I think it was you, Dr. Bargman, that yeah. surgical neck that you place and then the bleeding that happens around that site as your uh, exterior. Yeah, well, it was interesting because in this very lovely review, uh, one of the papers actually said there were fewer exit site infections with the embedded a catheter, which I found a little bit surprising. There was a more recent paper that suggested there was a trend to more exit site infections. And just for the fellows, the whole idea of using the stylet to, to perforate your exit site is supposed to be the least traumatic way to make an exit site and therefore lead to better healing and epithelialization of the exit site and thus hopefully fewer exit site infections. Whereas when you exteriorize a, an embedded catheter, it's always troubled me that you make a stab wound and then you pull the catheter through that stab wound and it always seemed to me that if it is important to use the stylet to have this least traumatic exit site, that this should lead to more exit site infections, not, not less. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Sarah, can I, any Sorry, can I, can I just bring up one more question? The, in the advantages versus disadvantages, 
in uh, I think the McCormick paper, one of them was, well, you can use full volume right away because everything's all healed up. And that is true from the risk of leak. But, you know, I troll a Facebook uh, PD patient site, and one of the commonest complaints is that the patients start with full volume PD and they feel like their stomach's going to explode. So I think part of the sort of gentle incremental approach is not only doing fewer exchanges, but starting with a lower volume and working up to a higher volume. So I don't see giving right away like a full volume as like necessarily something that the patients are going to appreciate. Yeah, definitely. Studies, uh, in the what caused the PD catheter failure? Was it just wasn't flushing or? So there's one of the studies. So the question is, did uh, did any of this study mention what caused the um, catheter failure? Uh, not really. They couldn't tell. But there is one of the studies that investigated the risk factors behind catheter loss, and it was the length of the catheter. Right. One of the comments that I wanted to make uh, in regards to the study you presented, the one with 349 patients, 88 of them, uh, you know, either didn't have their embedded catheter externalized or 30 of them were transitioned. Mm. Um, so that's like a 25% of the entire patient population who didn't get their catheter externalized or were transitioned to all the transplanted. That's, that's a big number. Those people potentially, you know, could have avoided surgery, general anesthesia, complications. I guess it's out of 400. The total is out of 400 and then 300 were exteriorized. This makes a lesser um, futile placement. So, so, so the question, the question that Naif had was about um, the yeah. patients who had their catheters placed and uh, and yeah, never use yeah, like futile, futile placement of um of the catheter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think they mentioned that it was like seven percent uh, futile placement. One of the studies you had mentioned that uh, counted was eighty-eight out of three hundred and forty-nine. I'm wondering if you could sort of go back to it. Was, were they not externalized because they were not ready for PD? Did they die? So on. I remember from the Ottawa paper, the futile placement was a combination of things. Like sometimes patients change their mind. They decided to do hemo. They died. They got transplanted. Mm -hmm. There were a whole, a, a whole slew of reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions in the fellows room? Well, I wonder if you just, if you only accounted for the gram positive, uh, so the question is, if we only accounted for the gram-positive peritonitis, that would make a difference in the failure? Right, yeah, would that, would that, do you think that would show in favor of the embedded approach since the idea is that it is more epithelialization, uh, less risk for uh, peritonitis? Okay, so the, so that's just in relation to the skin flora, not right. being the, the likely cause. Um, I don't know if that um, do we have that uh, granular uh, a quicker way, Sarah, is to hit escape, and then you can just uh, scroll up. Uh, that way you're out of presenter mode, and then you can just scroll uh, through your slides. Yeah, the total one is our four hundred, uh, and then the thir only thirty eight that are not exteriorized. Mm -hmm. But 50 also remained buried. 50 because they remained as CKD. Well, were because it, this is by the end of the that study period, right? It's not mm -hmm. it's not that they that they were that they were buried with the buried PD catheter. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Um okay, so um just a, a quick housekeeping announcement. So we've been working with the ISPD to get uh, all these uh, videos uploaded. They're currently on the ISPD YouTube channel, uh, the NAC channel. I will share that link uh, as well with all of you, the participants. Uh, we have all the, uh, the journal clubs starting from January of last year uploaded all the way up until January of this year. We're also in the process of embedding those uh, videos on the Vanderbilt website. So 
It's all accessible on YouTube. That way, if you have any fellows, trainees, colleagues who are interested in listening more uh, to that topic, you know, you can share them. They don't have to be able to attend, uh, you know, on time. You can always make up for it that way. Um, just uh, something that you know we thought was worthwhile to add um, access to the to the discussion for the larger community out there. All right, so I think. I think, you know, with that, I'd like to thank you, Sarah, for uh, a comprehensive presentation of the topic. I'd like to thank our, you know, all our panelists, Dr. Golper, Dr. Bargman, Dr. Cobert, Dr. Robari, uh, for, for this uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, our next uh, journal club next month, I believe, will be talking about uh, fungal peritonitis uh, and its treatment. So uh, looking forward to another fruitful educational meeting. Thanks, Osama. Bye. Thank you all so much. Take care. Bravo. Thank you.